All right, today took a little bit longer to go live, so my countdown was only off by about 100 million seconds. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, we have a new guest here to talk... um, so, Jackie Rollinson, could you introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers? Hi, guys and girls and everybody. Um, I'm Jackie, a sci-fi author, uh, born in South Africa, but living in the UK. Um, sometimes feel like I'm living on another planet, but that's me. All right. So have they corrupted you? How do you drink your beer? Oh, <laughs> not warm. It's got to be okay, cold. Good, good. I'm not, I'm not that British. <laughs> All right, so you, you get to stay. Uh, yeah. My first publisher is British, and he's he's always telling me it should be warm, but I just I think he's insane. Yeah, I would say that's insane. Okay, okay. Have you been uh, adopted into the cult of the hot tea yet? Um, yes, because my dad was British, so he was a so we learned to drink and um, to make tea since we were very little on a stool boiling kettle no health and safety back in those days <laughs> outstanding, outstanding. I, I i just can't do it i'll make myself drink hot tea if i'm not feeling well but but i, I live in uh the south part of the u.s where tea is meant to be drank iced and cold and sweet well, that sounds pretty good too though basically sugar water with a hint of tea for flavoring yeah i've got a super sweet tooth so that sounds that sounds amazing <laughs> <laughs> all right so the next part of the introduction to your listeners, how we found them. And so when I got an email, because uh, I'm subscribed to his newsletter from Terry Mixon about the Expanding Universe 7 anthology that you see up on the screen, uh, I dove right in and bought it. And then I said, hey, let's do some interviews because I like talking about short content. And so I started reaching out and she was the only other one that said yes. Yeah, so good for you. <laughs> um, so since this is the Blasters and Blades podcast, we can't get started without asking you the religion question first. So Stargate, Firefly, or Judge Dredd? Hmm. It's a tough one. Um, I think all of them are great, but Stargate wins hands down for me. It's just a classic. I need like some sort of soundboard where I could do like clapping every time people get it right. <laughs> all right, that is the absolute right answer. Stargate is amazing. Okay, what do you think of Stargate Universe? Um, it's good. It's good. I think anything Stargate for me personally. Outstanding. All right. And because we are polytheistic here, Red Sonia, Kroll, or Conan? Some 80s okay. uh, fantasy. Yeah. So I think it would have to be Red Sonia, but minus the love interest, because um, I do like a strong female character. Okay. Um, since we here at the Blasters and Blades love both the fantastical and the scientific, which was your first love, sci fi or fantasy? I think it was actually fantasy. Um, it's a bit of a merge, to be honest, because um, the first kind of adult or older book that I'd read was actually Lord of the Rings. So okay. I suppose fantasy. But I mean, I was playing sci-fi PC games quite young as well. So it was a little bit of a mix. Do you remember which one came first? Was it the, the PC sci-fi game or was it the book or was it something else? It probably was the PC game, if I'm thinking back. Um, yeah. Do you it's... remember what? Do you remember what the game was? It was Rama, um, the Arthur C. Clarke Rama Ooh, game. I didn't know yeah. that was a game. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's old. I mean, this might have been like, it might have been just when CDs started coming out on games. I mean, um, as a kid, my first I, computer was a Commodore 64, so so I, I remember the old. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so what is it you love about speculative fiction as a genre? Yeah. Um, I suppose it's just, I've just always loved the fact that the only limits are kind of your imagination. You could go anywhere, create anything. It's, it's kind of um, pure escapism. Okay. That's a good answer. So how did your love of speculative fiction trans, uh, transition into you writing stories in that space? Um, I suppose because I've always, um, absorbed as much sci-fi and fantasy as I possibly could. I, I'm always reading um, or watching series or anything at all. Um, it was probably a couple of years ago. It was probably about three to four years ago. Um, 
I was reading one of Michael Adderley's Kathiri and Gambits and something just clicked. And um, I just, because I've always had these stories and these characters kind of locked away in my head and I've never done anything with them. And um, it was kind of my dad that just said, come on, why don't you just write them then? And that was it. Um, that was when my first series was born. And, and since then I've now started, I've got all these half written stories I've now got to finish because yeah, they, I'm so excited. I have that problem. And then I get sometimes new authors will ask, well, where do you get your ideas? I'm like, what do you mean? How do you turn them off? Like sometimes exactly. it'd be nice to just sleep. Yeah. You know, you just need to, you need to write that down because it just pops in your head. You could be anywhere and then you could see something funny and it just turns into this character in your head and then this storyline and you just got to get it written down. I, I carry a little handheld recorder. And if something pops up like that, I just start talking into it. Sometimes people will look at you funny when you <laughs> dictate what they just saw happen. Like, what are you doing? But it, it's you need it on the um, on the Apple Watch or on a watch, any watch that's got the record so you can see like a little uh, secret spy, you know, talking into your watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so before you decided, you know, that you were going to be a writer, when you had those stories in your head, did you ever, as soon as you finished like a book that you liked or a TV show that you liked, like imagine the story kept going in your head? Um, I suppose so. I think you kind of do that with every um, I assume everyone does, but maybe they don't. I did, um, but I, I've heard people like, what are you talking about? Are you insane? The answer yeah. is yes, I am insane. That's besides the point. That's the same as like when people ask me if, if, you know, when I say, well, you know, when you read a book and you can see the characters and you can, you can, you, you can, you're in the world, aren't you? You kind of get sucked into this world. And um, other people are like, no, I can't see anything in my head. I'm like, what? That's just sadness. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at least they're reading, so I'll give them that. Because when I hear people like, oh, I don't like books, I don't like reading, I'm like, what is wrong with you? I know. You stole yeah. your soul. But all right, so many authors let their real-life uh, experiences influence the stories they tell. So were there any specific formidable moments that you feel like shaped you as a storyteller? I'm not too sure on that, to be honest. Um, uh, I suppose moving to a new country um finding my feet um kind of feeling like a bit of an outsider almost like I was on another planet <laughs> I mean it's Britain um, so I know, exactly. I'm gonna get hate mail but yeah and then obviously just like pushing ahead and finding your way um I think that all those things kind of helped shape me so what was the biggest cultural shock you had moving from South Africa to Great Britain um I think that the first thing I remember actually, because it was the first time I'd ever been on a plane as well. And as we were flying over London, I just couldn't believe how all the houses were kind of stuck together. That was the biggest thing for me that was such a shock and how close everyone lived um, in all the built up areas. Because in South Africa, obviously there's so much more space around everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's just kind of different way of life here, isn't it? Did it's you end up settling in uh, in London or in that area? So we live in the south of England now, further down southeast. Um, and I love it now. So we're kind of like in a nice, it's kind of quite green where we are. So I kind of I need to make sure there's loads of trees around me. Um, I can understand that. Yeah. Did the weather take getting used to? Yes. It's just so cold here. and But it's, it's weird, though, because I, like even in the winter – I get boiling hot, like I have to have the windows open, but I have to have the heating on. So my husband doesn't like that. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine the bills for that get a little pricey sometimes. Yes, not the most uh, energy efficient. So have you fallen in love with the, the iconic fish and chips that the Brits love to eat? I have. Although we do, we kind of had that in um, South Africa anyway. It was all like calamari and fish and chips and all down by the, the beach. So we kind of have that already. So I live in a beach town too, and we have a, a British expat who has a, a, a pub that actually sells like proper fish and chips, he says. Having never compared them to, to something over across the pond, I, I can't speak from, from certainty, but I, I can see why they like it so much. Oh, yeah, it is good. I mean, it's bad, but it's good. <laughs> Aren't the best things in life, though? <laughs> exactly. I know. That's just all the wrong way around, isn't it? It is, it is. So you know if it's good for you, it probably has no flavor. But if it tastes good, you know, eh, well, 
I'll just <laughs> yeah. die a few years earlier. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Transitioning from the writing side, let's talk about things from a fan angle. Has anybody asked for your autograph uh, yet? I know you're you're just starting out, but um, so I have had um someone from work um from my day job. Uh, a few people have randomly appeared at my desk with my book and kind of uh, surprised me, asking me to. Uh, sign my book give the give my autograph and just a little bit uh surprised because i am still quite new to it all but it's brilliant so i've come away and i've started uh practicing what i'm going to write in my books now <laughs> outstanding so you said it's brilliant is that a, a britishism that you picked up or do they say that in south africa too what was that sorry the, the expression it's brilliant when you when you were talking about it i hear a lot of the the british folks oh, say that yeah, it must be. I think I have probably picked that up here. Okay. Um, we've only interviewed um, one author besides you who was from South Africa, but he was uh, raised in overseas boarding school. So his his dialectic was so all over the place that it would be you couldn't really pin that down as, you know, that's his culture. Um, and that happens when you're when you're a world traveler, as they say. But all right. So finally, uh, what's the weirdest or funniest interaction you've had with fans since you started writing? Um, well, there hasn't been one yet, but uh, who knows? So uh, <laughs> welcoming the interactions. <laughs> all right. Well, so if you after listening to this interview, you decide to read her story and you're like, man, this is this is awesome. Then you just got to reach out so she can have something to answer next time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm waiting, um, everybody. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today, uh, I wanted to, this to be a brief episode where we dive into the world of anthologies and short stories. Uh, so we're going to interview um, Jackie about her short fiction that was included in the Expanding Universe 7 anthology. So uh, let's see what this anthology is all about. <clears throat> I'm going to try my movie trailer voice. Don't judge me when I screw it up because clearly <laughs> that guy has job security. I'm not taking it anytime soon. Explore the universe. Two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. Arthur C. Clarke pinned, pinned those words and they stand true to this day. Do we want to be alone? Leave it to science fiction authors to address that question in equal measure. Aliens can be peaceful or not. Who will emerge as the superior strain of intelligence? Humanity may be new to the game, but they aren't new to conflict. Fantastic races vying for dominance, a microcosm of the greater good, battles fought for higher ideals, or battles fought just to survive. War doesn't care about alien or human. The soldiers fight, and they fight hard, as if their very lives depend on it, because they do. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. I really okay. need that soundboard so I can get those effects, but that's the best yeah. you can do. All right. So, Jackie, uh, in that anthology, what was your story titled? Uh, my title is Gone Rogue. Okay. Uh, and can you give us a basic synopsis for that short story? Yeah. So um, just think, a tired, self-sufficient engineer, his name is Dax. Um, he wins a large ship uh, in a bet, and the ship has an onboard AI who turns out to be a little bit emotionally unstable. And um, things quickly begin to unravel. Okay. Um, did you give the AI gender or was it just sort of robotic AI? A female. She's female. Okay. And uh, do you say what gave chance he won this ship in? Um, in the story, I don't think I go into that too much. I actually, I had written quite a lot um, about that and I had to delete it because um, I had to stick to my 8,000 words from this one. Um, I have a tendency to ramble a bit as well. So Nothing but wrong I had that. said kind of it was like a gambling kind of bet, um, almost like a, a kind of a, a poker game and um, he'd end up winning this large decrepit old ship <laughs> so you know at the end of this period where the rights revert to you are you going to republish it with the expanded version or just as it is now i would like to yeah um i've got so many more ideas and you know i'd love to just kind of add on it a little bit but maybe not I'm, i mean maybe short and punchy the way it is now is you know i'd like people to read it and let me know if they want to hear more about it Okay, so what was the inspiration for this short story? Um, well, it was the brief was to obviously write a story based on the front cover. Um, so basically, two large battleships firing at one another, 
Um, and then any story at all, you can kind of link to that. So immediately my imagination went to two ships controlled completely by AIs um, with a helpless crew stuck in the middle. Okay. That has some shades of Stargate universe where they, uh, the ships were just attacking each other because it was in their programming and the <laughs> people who had programmed it were like long since dead. <laughs> so I could dig it. So does this story fit into a larger universe or does it stand alone? Um, well, the story is a standalone story because this is a new character, but it does, it is written in the same universe as my other books, which is the Hyperion universe. And, um, Obviously, you wouldn't have to read the other books to understand this story. Um, but if you do read the other books, then some of the planets, um, the races, the characters, you know, they may be familiar to you. Okay. So uh, if people aren't familiar with that larger universe, could you give us the Reader's Digest version? Um, so it's a pretty weird universe uh, with a wide variety of planets uh, and different all different races and um, aliens, and um, you have elite planets who all, who hold like the most advanced tech, and and some more of the traditional magical, slightly fantasy planets, um, and some of them which are kind of resource rich but completely tech poor, um, and then we have the Karakuan race who have. Um, kind of moved into the universe and are trying to kind of stake their claim on more of the the weaker planets. Um, and this is where like a kind of a union of some of the stronger uh, planets have kind of joined forces to fight this um, enemy. Um, and this enemy is kind of into some freaky gene mutation um, and experimenting on different aliens and... Um, and now they have their sights on capturing the main character, Emily. Um, she is not even aware of it to begin with. And um, yeah, that's kind of the, the beginning of it all. So what um, subgenre would this fit into? It sounds like it's got shades of space opera and, and mill SF in it. Totally. Yeah. Bang on. It's, it's a bit of a mix of both. Although they're, you know, I'm probably being a bit cheeky by adding there's obviously it's a little hint of fantasy in there as well um well, space fantasy is a thing yeah it is there is it's just because of obviously some of the powers and things like that they're more fantasy than sci-fi but generally the theme is a mix between space opera and um military sci-fi yeah so where does humanity fit in this are, are are humans in earth part of it or are you taking um the galaxy away from that when you write this universe so i have actually touched on earth um but they are not at the moment they haven't really played much of a part other than that they are a, a floating colony that kind of goes around trading with random planets and um so they've uh they've sold coffee and um coke and things like that to um different planets so it's kind of as far as it's gone right now and they well, might like sell um, or, or educate people on old Earth uh, movies and things. So then I've made reference to that. So, so does a planet not? Is the planet still exist? And then they just they're colonists out, or is the the planet actually drivable at this point? <laughs> it was a little unclear. Sorry, say that again. So you said Earth goes out. So are you talking about colonists from Earth? They have fleets that go out or is the Earth gone? Oh, yeah. Out? Sorry. So Earth is completely gone. Um, okay. It was destroyed. And um, yeah, so all that's left is this little, well, not little, huge kind of floating colony that kind of go on a ship. Um, would you call it a ship? It's like loads of ships kind of bolted together almost. Yeah, that's why I imagine it in country. my mind. Yeah. So before the Earth was destroyed, were, uh, did humanity seed the stars or is that the only humans are the ones that are on the um, Earth arc? In my universe, they are only on that arc. They're not, um, they haven't gotten involved with um, other planets. So these other planets, these other aliens are, have always been there. So this the captain that's the main character then is he is he human or is he another alien? 
Oh, on the, so he is um, alien, essentially. So he's from the planet Escaron. He is. Okay. Um, so is, is the rest of the collection um, of the hype, the universe, is the rest of that also space opera and, and Mill SF, basically? It is, yeah. And I've, I've written a short story, which is based on another character um, from my main book. And that one is actually free to get through my website, um, but it's also on Amazon to buy. Um, and, and that's completely military sci-fi, that one. Okay. And I will link to all that in the show notes, dear listeners. So if you want to check out her website and all of her, her stuff, that'll be there. All right. So we promised these short interviews for short fiction. So um, you mentioned that your story was, was mostly space opera with the military. So what is it about space opera as a genre that appeals to you? Um, I love the adventure, uh, the mischief, um, and the fast pace of the space opera. Of That's how I kind of interpret them. Um, and the characters building relationships with each other. Um, and as they get to kind of get to know each other, they give each other a bit of banter and hard time for amusement. Um, and then obviously then you can merge in the action and emotions. I just think it's a great all-rounder, really. All right. And one for the road. Uh, if you could live in this world you've created, would you? Oh, most definitely. Oh, definitely. Um, if I was to pick a planet, I would probably pick um, Jakar. That's where a lot of the uh, people with powers are. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> okay. How much plot armor would you need to survive in this universe? Oh, in the universe or the planets? B both. I don't know. <laughs> Because they're like some universe where like they're very grim dark. So like the Warhammer 40k universe, the books are sometimes fun to read, but uh, unless you've got like uh, millimeter, like you, unless you've got plot armor, you're dead in the first five seconds, right? Whereas oh, yeah. like Star Trek like universe, as long as you're not wearing a red shirt, you're pretty much okay. Yeah, I think it's more, it's you, you're all right. It's not that uh, deadly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So are these books available in audiobook as well, or just ebook? At the moment. They're not available in audiobook yet, but um, it's on the cards, so I'm looking into it. But I thought I'd kind of get book three and four done first, and then I would start converting to audio. Okay. All right. So um, can you tell listeners, Jackie, how everybody can find you? Uh, definitely. Um, so uh, you can, obviously, you can follow the notes afterwards, um, and all the information will be on there, but you can grab me on Facebook, um, on my Amazon author central page, um, on Instagram, um, or through my website, if you like. Um, yeah. It'd be great to hear from everybody. All right. And that'll all be in the show notes and Jackie, J-A-C-K-I, and then Rawlinson, R-A-W-L-I-N-S-O-N. -N. And again, all of that's in the show notes because we make your job easier. We'll also link to the anthology in the show notes. So if you're, you're curious, it is in Kindle Unlimited, correct? It is. Yes. So if you want to use your credit and give it a read, uh, lots of lots of good content in there. You can find us on our website at w uh, excuse me at anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades. Anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades. We're on Twitter at SF underscore fantasy underscore show. Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email us at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Again, blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. We're on the Facebook where all the shenanigans happen at facebook.com backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. You can support the show over on anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades for a monthly reoccurring subscription, much like a Patreon, or you can support us on buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Again, buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put in the comment section that it's for the podcast. I will keep Doc Seska and Nick Garber duly intoxicated. They will drink until their liver surrenders. And if Doc was here, she'd tell you she ain't no quitter. But she's at work today, so I will just move on. So thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Seska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom.